Hello, this is a conversation with Hilary Cottam, uh, who's the founder of Participle and someone that I've admired and been inspired by for a long time. So thank you very much it's for agreeing pleasure. to this really conversation. Nice to to um, when I uh, inveigled you into doing this, you said that you were intrigued by the idea of tribe and mm. that you had some all sorts of reactions to that. So mm. some more about that. So I think that tribe is a, a form of organisation that kind of predates the state, for one thing. So it sort of it doesn't kind of bring in ideas of the state to me. But also I think it's very, very patrilineal. So for me, tribe is a sort of very early patriarchal form of organisation. Um, so it doesn't immediately sound to me as something that I, for instance, would want to belong to or build versus sort of other concepts of the good life, I suppose. that's. Um, and also I think that that sort of anthropologists, when they kind of look at tribes, there's always been a very, very sort of complex kind of interweaving of belonging and how to kind of exercise power. And so lots of the things that we're perhaps thinking about how to champion are still very, very complex in those situations. So I suppose that's just what it kind of first made me think of. Tell me some more about what the good life means to you. So I think the good life is about relationships, really. It's a place and a space where you can have relationships with other people and with the earth, really. Um, so ultimately, that's what it brings into a kind of very, very human frame. And at the moment, we see everything moving absolutely in the other direction, really. So what would we... Where would we start if we wanted to try and move towards the good life from where we are now? Um, well, I think we'd start at a very, very domestic level and we'd start kind of at a you know, family, community, friendship kind of level and think about how we can build structures so that those relationships flourish, whether it's time to be with friends, time to be with family, time to do good work, all of those we have sort of got hooked on the idea that the only way to have a good life is to have a job and to be working every hour God sends. And there's something about work-life balance. We were talking about this at a Compass meeting and the idea that older people who are past retirement age or women who are staying at home looking after kids somehow are as good a way of living a life as, as somebody in a full-time job, that, that idea has vanished somehow, is not it? So I think, first of all, the whole idea of good work has vanished. So the idea of any level of society that you might have a job that is fulfilling, interesting, but leaves time for something else. You know, T.S. Eliot writing poems and being a banker. I mean, that's just gone. Um, so I think that that's really important. Like, what is, what is good work? Because work, you also find your meaning of life through work. So work is a kind of good thing in that way, as opposed to kind of a being on some sort of different idea of a job and a career track and all the things that we usually think of. Um, so I think that's really important, but also, I mean, I think if you're talking about time with family, um, I mean, the childcare debates, particularly for women, they're very, very complex, aren't they? Because actually, the whole debate is around how can we get good childcare, not around the fact that the relationship with the child might be something of value in and of itself. Um, I think that's, you know, that's pretty critical. There's something else I was going to say about it, but I've forgotten that. Well, and women are sort of being told that... You have to go to work when your children are seven or eight. You know that it's not much the before. opportunity. <laughs> well, and then yes. lots of women have yes. to do it before yes. that, and but lots of women want to. So that's but you know, but the but the oppo the idea that kind of relationships that nurture that all those things have an equal value has has completely disappeared, and I think it's very hard to find the language to bring those things back in. And then the other thing is that I think that people don't practice what they preach. So there's this huge sort of division in Britain between people who think and people who do. And, you know, we've got lots of people uh, working, you know, 24 hours a day talking about the importance of time. And actually, we all need, you know, we who are in positions of relative power, I mean, I don't really have power, but do you know what I mean? We need to kind of put into our daily lives those principles, not wait for others to act on them. And I think that's really important. But that's hard. So tell me a bit about the work that you've been doing, because I'll tell you the reason why I'm asking this is, is when I was thinking about this idea about tribe and solidarity, the sort of... The labour working class, I mean, I used to study um, the history of Bermondsey, which is a very close-knit, very solidaristic working class community, very wide, um, but organised sort of in defence against the sort of feckless underclass, the unemployed, the alcoholics, the single parent mums, you know, they weren't part of yeah. this respectable working class, they were on the outside and that's a group of people that you've been working quite a lot with so I'd be really interested to, to hear your take yeah. on all that. 
So one thing is that because I've got a PhD which is kind of anthropology and I've lived a long time in the barrio and I live underneath a bridge in the barrio and, um, and with um, sort of 40,000 people that live in a network of open sewers and I'm really interested in that idea in society about how everybody sort of needs somebody to look down on in order, you know, in this case the bridge being the metaphor, people literally looking down on you. So I think it's really interesting, particularly at times of fear or insecurity like now, that those ideas kind of obviously come to the fore because everybody's, uh, you know, we were talking before about how the difference is actually minuscule, but you've got to build a defence that I'm, I, you know, I might be struggling, but I'm not this person, and that, that's kind of, a, we all do that in our lives in different ways. Um, but I suppose... I mean, because I've worked a long time with public services, the thing that most strikes me is how much, uh, I suppose perhaps came from that early Labour history, but how much in the state is spent keeping people out of systems. So we see kind of in any public service that kind of up to 80% can be spent actually processing people and deciding who gets in. So we see all the time this kind of, uh, it's not quite what you're talking about, but I think it might have grown organically from that. And so one of the things I've been really interested in is that if you think about all the things that face us as challenges now, whether it is... I don't know, um, an ageing society or whether it's kind of the environmental challenges or whether it's the kind of health challenges we face, that these are universal problems and what the more people that are in the solution, the stronger that solution will be, that actually we need everybody to get in. And so one of the things we've been looking at is how can you build service and systems that are actually richer and stronger the more people use them rather than this sort of rather defensive idea that, you know, we've got to keep people out. And so whether we kind of like circle our, our ageing service or, um, I don't know, back our unemployment work, what's really important about those social networks is that, of course, the more people who use them, the more they grow. And the more people are actually putting something onto the platform, the more they use them, whether it's time or money or, or knowledge or whatever it is. So I think that's a completely different way of looking at the world that we're kind of trying to sort of bring into practice. So instead of gatekeeping and trying to minimise the amount of state money you have to spend on people, yes. you're proposing in a sense of sort of seeing people as a contribution rather than as a cost. Yes, I think, I think that you know, the whole thing is around people's capabilities and how they can bring them forward and I'm absolutely committed to the idea of universal service. So do you think this division that Cameron has in a sense uh, raised and, and is, but it's a division that the whole political spectrum is talking about a bit sort of between the deserving and the undeserving yeah. some sense that only people who contribute should be allowed to gain from the state I mean is that just the wrong idea there's something in there that chimes with me because obviously I kind of believe at some level that everybody should contribute and do something but I think what 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 I think is that people who are not contributing are so small in number. I mean, you know, if you look at kind of social security or whatever, what it's meant to be 0.7% of the population or something, that it seems to me completely absurd to kind of build a whole narrative and a whole way of looking at the world through this absolutely tiny number of people. And I think that the stories we tell are really important. So something, for instance, that is a brilliant story is that when we started our unemployment work, we went to a job centre in South London and we built a fake door and we stood up and we said... Who wants to get out of here? Like, who wants to get out of this system and find work? And we asked people to pay us a fiver to come through the door. And as the hour went on, you know, we raised it to £20. Everybody wanted to come through the door. And the reason that everybody wants to come through the door was because everybody in that job centre believed that everybody except themselves was basically feckless. So that's a kind of incredible internalisation of a narrative. And so everybody's like, get me out of here, get me away from these people who are kind of not contributing in, your, you know, in the way that you phrased it, and get me into somewhere else where people might be, and then I can kind of work with them and I can build some kind of support system. But I think then you begin to see kind of in the sort of the nitty-gritty of our lives how it's very, very difficult to build solidarity, to build a different way of being, whilst you've got this sort of meta-narrative of, of you know, losers or feckless people or whatever, the sort of, you know, the kind of current rhetoric is. What's the problem? What is it that we do wrong? Um, well, I think it's interesting where this whole transactional, um, I mean, you know, like Morris Glasman would say that the, the welfare state was overly transactional right from the beginning. It isn't something that's kind of accreted over the kind of decades. But in some way, the state is very, very transactional, which makes it hard to kind of really engage with people. So it's more about what that means? What does transactional mean in your terms? Well, I think that transactional means that a service is a is a sort of dehumanized package that happens to you. And even if and even personalizing that dehumanized package means in some way kind of having a conversation to make you do whatever the kind of ten steps are in the package. 
I think that change and, I mean, development happens through an emotional engagement for anybody at any stage in their life. And that that happens through a conversation and a relationship with somebody which is very, very different from the way that we've, we've structured our services. And, and the more I kind of, the more this work I do, the more I become alarmed really in the way that our current public services, the kind of developmental context has been hollowed out. And people say extraordinary things, you know, like after the baby Peter Connolly uh, tragedy, Ed Ball said that he promised Britain the greatest child protection service in the world. I mean, isn't that just the most extraordinary national statement of what we're going to offer children in Britain today? But nobody, not a single person, commented that this might not be actually a sort of good developmental way of bringing up our children. I suppose the tension is that governments are almost incapable... I mean, governments are systems. They're not capable of having relationships. I mean, can the state have a relationship with you? How do we get that relationship developmental side of humanity yeah. into state activity? Well, first of all, I think the state can start to tell very, very different stories about what matters. And I think that would be really important. I think that people are, you know, whether it's sort of Victorian novels or African myths or, you know, there's kind of narratives in life that, that are helpful to people about journeys and kind of and an element of struggle as well and how you kind of develop meaning in your life which is really really important and I think the state can start to talk about that rather than some of the things that we've been already talking about that it talks about so I think that how it positions itself is really really important I think what it measures is really important so you know I think we do need to kind of begin to measure capabilities and what we foster and we need to kind of look at developmental pathways rather than sort of outputs or outcomes in a kind of much more traditional way and then I think that we can have a spine of services that is predicted in a kind of traditional state way, but we can have this far more space for kind of invention around the edges and at the front line, which would be completely inverting the power structures of how you know, the state is operating now. Well, and it does mean some sort of connection with our whole lives yes. rather than just little snapshots yes, where definitely. you connect with somebody of, you know, in this particular situation, yes. but you don't connect it up to everything else that's happening. Um, people. That's definitely right. You have to kind of, you know, that is a sort of cradle to grave. But it is also a story that asks you to contribute, I think. It's not a sort of we'll take care of you in a kind of paternalistic way. It's, it's this is the framework and you can kind of contribute something to this framework. And the thing is, we're seeing this work. I mean, you know, obviously participles quite small, but, you know, we have thousands of, of people who use our different services. And I think what's really interesting is that if you design something from the get-go that really works with the grain of people's lives, that is universal, people immediately contribute. If you say, oh, we've got this 1950 service that we can't afford to run anymore, and we were thinking that, you know, the population might stand up and do this bit of it, of course people are horrified. Nobody wants to do that. It wasn't designed to do that in the first place. But your real experience is that people would willingly, do willingly do things for themselves and each other, but not, but, I'm not quite sure what, but the, what the but not is, but not if the state's organising it, or but not if... Yes, not if they perceive it's something that the state should really be doing themselves. I do think that's the case. I mean, it's so complicated. It's like when we designed our, our older people's work circle, we asked people whether they would be happy to help other older people on their streets. And they said they really would, but they'd be, and they saw people who clearly needed their support, but they'd be much too terrified to go up to them and say, can I help you? So we have this, we don't do this, but we should, you know, a sticker in your window, like a neighbourhood watch thing of like, I'm here to help. You can, you can call on me, it's fine. If you knock on my front door, I'm, I'm happy to help you. So it's at that kind of really micro level, as well as then, OK, now we've got an older people's service. What time can you put on? What can you offer at this stage in your life? What, what can you actually do? And it's people really contribute in a way that, you know, I obviously believe in all of this stuff, but that I'm very, very surprised about. And it's interesting because I've been trying to work with local authorities around some of this stuff. It's very hard sometimes for bureaucracies to see that there's another way of doing things. I mean, it was just simply inviting older people to a meeting and the way of inviting people was to put up posters about the fact that there was a public meeting. And I was thinking, how brave would I have to be to just walk in off the street into a meeting full of strangers 
I wouldn't do that. That would be terrifying. But if somebody had knocked on my door and said, I'm going to this meeting, I live next door, yeah. would, would you, you come, come with me? Yeah. That would be a different experience. Yes. Or if it was more like a kind of Tupperware party, you know, organised by one of your neighbours locally. Yeah. But yes, and not most people, after all, you know, are not the politicos that we might be that kind of find a meeting, you know, a, a form of, of social organisation and they're happy. You know, that is a very, very small percentage of the population. Yes, no, we have managed to make meetings as dull as yeah. possible yeah. to make them for so, reasons yes. I don't quite understood. But what about the right-wing response to this, which would be to say, if people don't look after themselves, if they're feckless, if they're not, you know, aid, if, they're, if they're not putting enough effort in, we shouldn't really be trying to spoon feed them. Well, I think there's two problems with the right wing response. One is that, of course, uh, you know, community contribution is much loved, but the interconnection with the state is missing. So, I mean, I think it's really problematic that the last Labour government had kind of a theory of the state, but no theory of humanity, people. And now this government's got, you know, in the big society, it has got some, like, theory might be a bit strong, but it's got some ideas, but it's got no sense of how the state might connect. So again, with Circle, we can do we can do all the community contribution, but we can't really reinvent adult social care until the state, with all its resources, begins to join us. And as we were talking earlier, we've got circles where that's happening really, really well, but it's down to kind of local politicians and uh, local authority leaders and people within the local authority that, that get that. So that's one problem with the kind of the right, is that where is that kind of theory of the state and how does that connect? But the other thing I think is that, you know, look, a capitalist society has winners and losers and you can't then individualise the loss in that, that way. And we see this, for instance, with our health work, is that people want to change their lives and they understand so well that they're swimming against a kind of much bigger tide in terms of diet, exercise, all those things, and they just can't do it alone. So it's you can't then say, you know, well, this person is a, a feckless smoker or a feckless fat person or whatever it is, and, you know, now they must pay their own way, and these narratives are beginning, aren't they? I mean, we, you know, they're growing all the time. I mean, you have to understand something at a kind of much broader social level, don't you? I mean, obviously you think that, but, you know... So that would be my, my response. I guess there is a sense in which... You know, if somebody is really free riding, if somebody is deliberately, you know, stealing money from the state or from anybody else, or, you know, just not... Is, is there some sort of mindset, at least, of being willing to be part of some collaborative, cooperative effort? Are there not... What, what, where are the limits, I guess, of, of our obligations to each other? Well, I suppose, you know, this might, you might just think this is a cop-out, but I just, I'm not that worried because, my, because I think there's hardly any of those people. Let's stop worrying about the worst case scenario and, as I say, tell different stories and build a better case scenario and we'll see people join in. And I think the family work we do has really shown that to me, that even in the kind of most desperate of circumstances, people want to kind of build their capabilities. And then the other thing I'd say about that is that, I mean, the, the kind of rise of the discipline of economics and the framing in which we look through everything, so that whole kind of free rider language is this kind of economic narrative. But, you know, I'm a social scientist. I've kind of, you know, I'm really interested in anthropology, psychoanalytic theory. That's the kind of way in which I look at the world. And when I sit on the sofas with these families, I've got to be careful what I say, but um, what strikes me is how utterly painful and damaging and awful their lives are. I mean, you might say they're free riders, but does anybody really want to be that kind of free rider? I mean, their lives are truly poor, by which I don't mean just economically poor, but just limited. Um, which is why I think in every single case in our work where people have actually trusted the relationship, those families have dared to work with us to build a way out of where they are now future governments, political parties, what's their role in this? Where, where, how would we encourage them to do, some, do the right thing? Well, and this is the, my, the daily challenge of my life. So I suppose, I mean, if we took Circle, the older service, I don't understand why the next government would not just say this is a core part of our kind of health and social care offer. We're going to scale this across the country immediately. Um, and in so doing 
more people would join. And the thing, it's a kind of self-perpetuating narrative, as I've said, the more people on the system, the more robust the system is. And then start a conversation of, I mean, if you think, let's say, that Circle kind of does very good preventative work and does low-level adult social care, but could do much more, then we can start a conversation about how we can begin to kind of move adult services onto that platform. But that never happens. What happens is that the whole system carries on, and another paper of whatever colour is published and there'll be a little box that talks about circle. You know, I'm only using my own work as an example. But obviously, you, you know, unless you actually invest and take this seriously and begin to kind of unlock resources in other areas and other kind of spheres of the economy, you don't begin to move that on. So There isn't a danger that if government took it over or even sponsored it, it would become a government scheme instead of a social collaborative scheme? Well, they wouldn't be able to take it over because it's basically a network run by members. So there's no, there's no, like, there's no committee, there's, no, there's nowhere to, for it to be taken over. If we were to think more broadly in terms of the good life and how the state might have a role in, in promoting the good life, what would you be wanting government to do in the future? Well, I'd want them to concentrate much more on the economic sphere, actually. You know, I would, want, um, I would want the conversation to be kind of much more where we started, around kind of what is good work and how can we create spaces for different things to happen. So, you know, the first thing I'd want to address is the kind of declining wage share of the economy. I mean, I think that it's just impossible to talk about these things in such unequal societies and where, you know, wages have become so low and then have a kind of debate about the welfare state expecting that to be fixed because because living in that way is kind of socially emotionally psychically damaging do you, do you see what i'm saying and then it becomes harder and harder for people to kind of contribute and belong to the same kind of a tribe i suppose you would say and what about the poet who doesn't want to earn money because they're busily being a poet and would be happy to live on benefits in order to do that is that an okay thing, way of living? Well, I don't know what they might be contributing. I mean, and I don't know why they would... Ne yes, I mean, I don't know, would they live on benefits? I don't know. I mean, nobody could live on benefits now, could they, even if they were a poet? I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> Maybe you could have done that. very difficult. Yeah, it's You'd not have to sell a lot of exactly, poets. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So I don't know, but I do definitely think that at the moment, you know, we've got kind of the idea of a time economy, we've got the idea of a kind of monetary economy, we've got to bring, you know, all those things together in some way that we haven't even started to do at the moment. So I don't know, I, I need to meet the poet and find what they've got to offer to the party, but I'm sure they've got something. I suppose I'm really struck by how the narrative about fecklessness has taken off. And so, and I'm just really interested because that's where you work. So I'm pushing you about that because yeah. I'm trying to see what the alternative narrative might be and what else we'd say. Yes. Um, so I'm hunting for, for your words to be able to, to, to find ways to respond to that. But I do think that that is, I mean, so for instance, when I talked about our family work on Radio 4, which is one of the few times that I've kind of addressed the sort of national audience that isn't in think tank land or, I mean, my mailbag was unbelievable from serving... Um, soldiers to mums to nurses I do think that there is a narrative in that that whole you know we're now we're calling it relational welfare which is too complicated but there is in let's call it the good life there is a narrative in there that chimes with people and I really think that to begin to tell those stories the feckless part will disappear but also that feckless part comes because this is back to your Bermondsey work I think that everybody is struggling and if everybody feels insecure then of course you know it's sort of dog eat dog you you pick on the people that are even weaker than you so what were the people saying in your post bag I mean what they're saying is this is common sense why is some government not doing this and then they're sending you endless examples of how they themselves try to contribute try to kind of do things in their community and find it completely blocked give me an example of how the state pulls apart what it does wrong I suppose that, that when the state takes decisions about where to locate services, what services to provide and what to cut, it, it can, it's looking in a quite a sort of telescopic way at, at sort of, you know, we talk about targets and delivery and we have all this language. And I think what it can't see is what's already being provided in a community, how relationships have been built that might cover for different things, and what you would actually do if you saw, if you saw those networks. So just 
it's a sort of final thing. Yeah. Like you mentioned relational welfare. Yes. Did I get the phrase yes. right? Yes. Tell, tell me some bit more about what that might mean mm. and how that might work. Well, when we started our work at Participle, we had this kind of mission, we still have it, Beveridge 4.0, which was really, at the end of his life, Beveridge said that he'd left out people and communities and he'd concentrated too much on institutions, and that he thought that people were already beginning to define themselves by the institutions, so they categorised their needs according to, you know, they, in their personal lives, which is, again, back to what we've been talking about, began to talk the language of the state and the institutions, and that this was very damaging. And so um, we kind of took a capability sort of counter theory if you like and said that what we wanted to do was build amongst everybody the capability to have good nurturing relationships because you need them in your personal life but you also can't work unless you can be part of a team and, and sort of keep relationships going the ability to work and learn and so kind of have the good life through kind of real work and inquiry and, and continued learning and then also some contribution to community which is was a weird kind of catch-all because that means sort of contributing to your highly local community but also taking care of the planet really that you it had to be um, and so we've we've built everything around that and we measure these capabilities in our work but more and more I've seen that what sort of architectonic I mean what's absolutely core is the relationship and that actually if you begin to kind of look at relationships, see everything through the eyes of relationships, value not the surface itself but the kind of relational interaction, literally count with older people, are you building kind of resilient relationships to help them through their older age, that not only is that the most important thing we do but seems to be the most powerful sort of, I don't know, incursion into the kind of predominant culture, I don't even know how to say it but it seems to be the thing that is, you know, you were talking about earlier about when you work with a local authority partner who wants to move in a certain way, how do you actually make that happen? And this seems to be something that people can really hold on to. So we've begun to call it relational welfare because it seems to have the most power. It does seem to me that there's something here about bureaucracies turning the delivery of welfare into a sort of machine thing. Yes. Where you standardise the outcomes and you standardise the products and everybody gets the same product and you can count it and you can yes. measure it and you can rag rate it and you can do all sorts of things to it. But it's a machine producing it. Com I mean, I came into community work in the 70s when there weren't any of those systems. And talking to young people in, in social work or in community work now, they cannot imagine a world in which everything that you did wasn't measured and counted, where okay. actually you were just out there working out what was the right thing to do, making judgments, helping people. Yes. And of course, some of what happened was pretty rubbish and some of what happened was totally brilliant yeah. and there was much more variation. Yes. And there's something here about people bringing the whole human being to work and yes. not just bits of themselves. Yes. Because to do what you're asking of people, either in the community sector, but also you know, if they were a social worker or a teacher or something, to be a fully human being with all your intelligence and creativity trying to work out how to help someone else is different to running some of the systems we've yes. got. And it's really interesting. So when we, when we so within our family work, for instance, we say that all the resource exists at the front line and we interview existing frontline workers and say who would like to join. Lots of people want to join because actually they don't want to fill out forms, they want to do real work, that's why they trained. But there has of course also been a hollowing out of experience, which is something that it's difficult to talk about because of course there's lots of people who may have done that in the 1970s and can't wait to do it again. There's lots of people who've been trained since in other ways that is harder to have, you know, there's got to be core skills in there and it's harder to find those core skills. But also I think to bring the whole person to work is very exhausting. So the other thing that marks our life teams is that, you know, lower caseloads, really good supervision, by which I mean, you know, professional, therapeutically trained supervision, not just sort of management supervision. That's really important too, but really nurturing, time to reflect as a team so nothing becomes personalised. I mean, this is really difficult work. So the culture around those teams is also highly relational. You know, you can't expect people to deliver relational services within sort of a back office of bureaucracy. Um, so what we're talking about is really profound. Yes, and and can we do this and have some of the sort of systems and safeguards and performance management type stuff that we brought in? I mean, can we have both, or do we have to choose completely? Well, I don't. I don't think we. I think we can. Ha I mean, obviously, for instance, with the family work, safeguarding is really. I mean, we can't ignore it. We can say that a culture has become too extreme, but we're dealing with very, very difficult. 
uh, situations. I mean, one of the things that strikes me, there have been several cases in our work, not only have children come out of care and gone back to their families, but there have been a significant number, we're working with very small numbers, but within that, of families where there was no idea and now child protection cases have come to the fore and children have gone into care. So I think what this shows me is that, yes, we have to take it seriously, but actually there is a way, there's a, in a more relational way of working, we are also probably more likely to see where that safeguarding is really actually needed. I mean, the thing we haven't talked about is why these systems became so bureaucratic. I mean, do you think it's because they just weren't performing and it's the, it was the only way to drive something better? I am a bit, it's a good question and perhaps it's a good question to to just leave hanging a bit. I I remember what happened in in the 97 or whatever when all these systems got brought and they were beginning to emerge before but suddenly everything was measured and everything was counted and the systems became. But they didn't start off quite as programmatic and quite as rigid as they have become and suddenly particularly in children's services but also to an extent in adult social care I think the but best everywhere in schools with the way you learn the lack of curriculum the testing I mean everywhere around us it's everything's measured everything's counted and there's no actual content well, I mean, I'm being extreme but you know <laughs> well and two things I think that the danger is that we waste a lot of public money in the processes before you actually do the thing itself mm. and the thing itself starts to disappear yeah. because you know and, I, and certainly in in social care you know we've got so many processes before anybody ever gets any care that that eats up yeah, an awful lot yeah, of the money exactly. so there's yes. that problem um but there's also i think the problem of of just measuring the wrong things right you yes. know just lose i mean i mean it's at staffordshire and, and everything that's happened yeah, since yeah, then it's yeah. just such the most terrifying example of hundreds and hundreds of measurements but nobody finding out yeah. that the patients were being neglected yeah. and i could you know i there was a story of i heard about um, a hospital ward where somebody was going round interviewing the patients about what they felt in the service while in the corner somebody who couldn't feed themselves was lying there with their meal set next to them not being fed and you yeah. think well the person with the flip with the clipboard could have fed the patient instead of doing the patient thing if yes. they'd have just thought yes. Yes. and seen and used their initiative something else would have been the outcome of that but you see this, I think I see this in our family work. I see that the only way to survive in those bureaucracies as a worker is to shut down, and you literally don't see it. But there are loads and loads and loads of really nice, sensible, kind, generous people at all levels. Oh, absolutely. So, the th you know, right at the top, I, you know, I work with quite a lot of, of senior managers. They're good people too. Everybody's a good person individually. Yes, and very well meaning. So, we've done something yeah. peculiar. Yeah that needs to be under. So maybe if we're going to have the good life, we're going to have to explore all these things. We are going to have to explore all these things. And then we will definitely be happier. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jimmy. That's been great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.